of the world would not be the same. Few people laughed. Few people cried. Most people were silent. I remembered the line from the Hindu scripture, the Bhagavad Gita. Vishnu is trying to persuade the prince that he should do his duty and to impress him takes on his multi-armed form and says, now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. I suppose we all thought that one way or another. What do I do on Monday? Dream, dream, dream. What do I do on Tuesday? Dream, dream, dream. Wednesday, Thursday comes and then I do the same thing over again. Oh, what do I do on Friday? Dream, dream, dream Gee, but I'm a busy guy I make a nice living Strange as it seems I'm a guy getting by Living on dreams And what do I do on weekends? I'm with you Then my dreams come steadily forward. Heralded by a thousand events, reported daily in press and in radio, this chilling shade touches each one of us in some way. And over the whole body of society, this threat of war hampers progress and slows down the processes of peace, preventing the fulfillment of life that man's growing conquest of nature promises. Civilization stands in mortal danger. We have learned some things more rapidly than others. The cool and methodical searching by scientists has given us an ever-growing control of the physical world. Has provided each one of us with a thousand mechanical slaves. Yet, through all the years of opportunity, we have not learned how to get along with our neighbors. Man with man. Or nation with nation. After nearly 2,000 years of the Christian era, we seek justice through slaughter and expect good to emerge from the reeking evil of war. This is your problem and mine. All over the world, men give lip service to peace. It is so easy to say the right thing, but only a pitiful minority is willing to pay the price of peace in the only coin which will buy it. Study, understanding, thought, and action. Peace is everyone's business. It doesn't just happen. Either you want peace and are willing to work for it, 
or you must be prepared to accept the consequences of your inaction. The war victims of every nation accuse us from their graves. We cannot shift the blame for war or its innocent dead. Just how badly do you want peace anyway? Stop and ask yourself, how much do I want peace? Real peace from now on. Come now, let's be realistic. Of course we want peace. We've always had wars, and we always win. War is a part of human nature. War or no war, we Americans aren't doing so bad. Look at the progress we've made. You don't really want peace. Probably you don't want war either. But most people who convince themselves that war is inevitable have visions of standing on the sidelines where the risk is slight. This man calls himself a realist, but he ignores the fact that there will be no sidelines in the next war. He hides from the consequences of the two most important discoveries of our time, high-speed transportation by airplane and rocket, and the discovery of atomic fission. The first of these has reduced the world to the size of a county. The second has provided the means to destroy that county. In past wars, most Americans have lived comfortably behind the gun. In the war of tomorrow, we shall be in front of the gun. All of us. Yes, tomorrow's war will be very different. Really? Who says so? The men who made the gadget that will kill us. They say so. The man who lives in the White House, he says so. The heads of these universities, they say so. The men who saw the bomb at Almogordo, they say so. The people of Hiroshima, who felt the force of the blast, they say so. The top men of our armed forces, they say so. Who, knowing the facts, doesn't say so? No one. Albert Einstein, respected by all the democratic world, tells us what to expect in the war of tomorrow, the war that will be so different. And remember that this scientist speaks with the authority of one whose thought crystallized into a little three-letter equation, set men on the long search for atomic energy. Einstein says many millions of Americans might die in a surprise attack with atomic bombs. But if millions of casualties surpass your powers of imagination, think rather this could mean about one out of three of you. And remember, this estimate takes no account of the aftermath, which by starvation and disease might take another one out of three of you. The progress of science is like a snowball rolling downhill. The bigger it gets, the faster it goes. In peacetime, the benefits of this progress are too often wasted by competitive armies. In war, scientific progress leads to weapons so terrible that neither man nor things made by man can survive. are the jet planes. They will carry men faster than any living thing has ever moved before in the service of destruction. There are combination jet and rocket bombers. On the drawing board today, or was it yesterday, is a plane with more than 400,000 horsepower. Enough power to run a small city packed into a single vehicle to carry death.
There are the true rockets. Even man's aspiration to conquer the void between planets has been prostituted to the uses of war. Self-guiding atomic rockets with speeds of several thousands of miles per hour and ranges sufficient to span an ocean are now within sight. the bacteria. In the white laboratories, men trained to fight against germs are now training to fight with them. As day succeeds day, the germ cultures are coaxed into an increasing deadliness in preparation for that grim hour when they may be wafted down on broken cities to complete the work of destruction and to creep amongst the wounded in the bodies of rabid rats surgical poison in pure crystalline form. This substance is so deadly that a single cubic inch of it, dispensed in measured doses, could kill every human being on the North American continent. Can you imagine the effects of its use? And over and above all these, there is the bomb. Yes, the bomb. That familiar symbol of a new age, about which we have talked so much that we now take it for granted. But the bomb, too, is changing. Men talk already of atomic bombs with 1,000 times the destructive power of those dropped on Japan. Yes, it is getting bigger. And it is getting cheaper. in terms of their destructive power, may be as little as 1% of the cost of any previous weapon. And there will be more of them. there will be plenty of bombs. The more we make, the faster we shall be able to make them. The genius of man for mass production can be relied upon to provide annihilation in wholesale lots. But these things are secrets, American secrets. Instead of sitting here talking, we ought to be on our toes to see that someone doesn't blab them. These are not our secrets. They are nature's secrets, and nature is not partial to America, nor to Russia, nor to blonde Nordics, nor to any other segment of humanity. She gives true answers to all who ask sensible questions, according to the methods of science. The science on which the bomb is based has been developing for many years in many lands. The materials needed to make bombs are plentiful and widely dispersed. In a comparatively short time, similar or more powerful bombs will be made in other countries. There is no hope of an American monopoly. Well, at least we have a head start. We can defend ourselves. Against atomic bombs, there is no defense. 
Einstein says that Americans, being an ingenious people, find it hard to believe that there is no foreseeable defense against atomic bombs. But this is a basic fact. Scientists do not even know of any field of study which holds any hope of adequate defense. There will be defensive tactics and devices which will increase the cost of an attack. But let us count also the cost of such a defense. We could disperse our cities at a cost of $300 billion and practically all personal liberty. In order to stop saboteurs armed with atomic explosives, we could search all planes and trains and boats and automobiles crossing our borders from now on. We could open every single package with a screwdriver if necessary under military supervision of commerce. We could remain on a constant 24 hour day in day out alert under some type of dictatorship. We could devote all of our scientific effort to the constant improvement of weapons at the sacrifice of most constructive scientific progress. We could restrict ourselves to a standard of living under which everything but the barest essential of existence would be sacrificed to a futile defense against the inevitable. Such a defense means a totalitarian America. A regimented population. A militarized industry. This is the way it always begins. This is the way it always ends. Man has fanned the flames of war to such a furious heat that neither aggressor nor defender can survive. There can be no victims, only the survivors and their dead. The weapons of the next war will not distinguish between good and evil, nor examine the motives of their victims. They may be made for defense, but they are destined to kill. To kill or to maim or to poison with radiation, according to the whim of fate. Most of the men and women and children living on the earth today. There isn't any place you can hide to be safe in a war like that. True. But many people are trying to hide from their duty to prevent that war. That's foolish. Do they think that hiding today will prevent the war tomorrow from which there is no hiding? Let's ask them. Maybe some are in our audience now. Mr. Smith, where do you hide? Do you try to hide behind the excuse that uh, our own country has already done everything it can do? And do you feel safe hiding there? And you, you over there, do you hide by saying that you are just an ordinary person and can do nothing alone? Is that a safe hiding place? And you, where do you hide? Behind an army, navy, and air force so strong that no other nation will dare to start a war? Is it safe there, hiding behind the atom bomb? Or perhaps you hide behind the United Nations Charter. Does that give safety enough to prevent atomic war? Do you oppose true world government because that would make your own government less powerful? Are you safe now in its independence and power? Do you bury yourself in other duties which you feel are more important than preventing war? 
Can we all find safety hiding there? And you. And you. And you. What are your favorite alibis for doing nothing in this hour of crisis? Where do you try to hide? Are you safe? Hiding there. And are they safe where you hide? You're watching Sleepcore, Pleasant Dreams. Before we look at next week's Westinghouse program, here is something well worth remembering. Now that the world has learned how to tap atomic energy with the atomic bomb, what a blessing it would be if science could harness this vast atomic energy to generate electricity, to propel ships, to do the work of the world. Well, it's on the way. Here at Westinghouse, as men write another chapter in the sureness behind every Westinghouse product, Scientists are developing the world's first atomic power plant for ship propulsion. Entrusted by the Navy and the Atomic Energy Commission, Westinghouse men are converting basic data from the University of Chicago into the atomic power plant. So once more, Westinghouse engineering and research chart the path of the future. If it's a product for home or business, or farm or factory, you can be sure if it's Westinghouse. In a nuclear attack on this country, one of the greatest threats would be radioactive fallout. While heat and blast effects of even the largest bombs would have a definite limit, any area could be threatened by fallout. The large number of weapons which probably would be dropped in a full-scale attack would produce fallout, ranging from light to intense over much of the nation. Weapons exploded close to the earth cause greatest fallout hazards. Thousands of tons of earth particles are drawn upward into the ascending mushroom cloud where radioactive products of the nuclear explosion contaminate them. These particles are carried by the high altitude winds for many miles. Eventually they settle to earth and this is called radioactive fallout. We are all subjected to radiation from outer space and from radioactive material of the Earth's crust. We're exposed to it when the doctor x-rays us and on many other occasions. Radiation in small or controlled amounts like that are not dangerous. But in large amounts, the amounts produced by nuclear explosions, radiation can make you seriously ill or even kill you. 
Radiation produced by nuclear weapons presents a revolutionary threat to our country. In an enemy attack, it could become a direct threat to us all. Fortunately, there are means of protecting ourselves, means so effective that civil defense officials believe everyone can survive fallout if they take a few simple precautions to protect themselves. The biggest danger from fallout is the fact that the particles do not have to touch you to endanger you. Their deadly rays can penetrate any kind of material, but the material through which they pass absorbs part of the radiation and reduces the hazard. Your safety depends upon putting a sufficient mass between yourself and the fallout. Concrete, bricks, earth, or sand are the best, but in a pinch, any heavy material will do. Civil defense officials recommend that everyone prepare a shelter. In most areas of the country, you would receive ample protection in a basement shelter constructed of eight inch concrete walls. This provides the same shielding as 12 inches of earth, 16 inches of books, or 30 inches of wood. To be certain of adequate protection, however, the shielding should be that equivalent of three feet of earth. Civil defense officials recommend that for the best fallout protection, your family have these two things, an approved fallout shelter and enough supplies to enable you to stay in it for a maximum of two weeks. Within that two week period, it is estimated that community resources will have been restored to give you some help. A short time later, assistance should be available from the state and federal governments. Get started right away at protecting your family from fallout. Plans for approved shelters are available from your civil defense officials. Some of the shelters you can build yourself. The more elaborate models can be undertaken by a contractor. Let us look at five shelters developed by the Office of Civil and Defense Mobilization, any one of which will provide good fallout protection for your family. First, the basement concrete block shelter is specifically designed as a do-it-yourself project. The cost will vary according to your area, but should range between $150 and $200 for materials. It would provide all the protection needed in most areas. You must be sure the shelter has the proper doorway, air vents, and ceiling beams capable of holding two layers of concrete blocks. Plans for this shelter can be incorporated easily into new home construction. In all of these shelters, incidentally, you must be sure to use solid concrete blocks rather than the hollow variety. The hollow kind will not give adequate shielding unless they are filled with cement, sand, or earth. The second recommended shelter is the above-ground double wall shelter. It is an outdoor above-ground construction which also may be built with concrete blocks. It is ideal for regions where water or rocks make it impractical to build underground. Most people would want to hire a contractor to build it. Materials would cost about $700 plus the contractor's fee. Virtually absolute protection from fallout is furnished by the double wall construction with 20 inches of earth between and the six inch concrete ceiling covered with 20 inches of gravel. Third, the pre-shaped metal shelter made from pre-shaped corrugated metal sections or pre-cast concrete can be constructed either underground or above ground. This shelter is also suitable for regions where rock or water are close to the surface. When covered with three feet of earth and given a protected entrance, 
it also will provide almost absolute protection. The cost, like the double wall shelter, is about $700 plus the fee of a contractor who probably would be needed to build it. Number four, the underground concrete shelter can be built by a contractor for about $1,000 to $1,500, depending upon the type of entrance used. Plans are designed so that it can have either a stairway entrance, such as is shown here, or with a hatchway entrance. The shelter can be built with a roof at ground level and mounded over with earth, or it can be built below ground level or into an embankment. Last, the concrete basement shelter is similar to the underground concrete shelter, except that it is designed as an added room to the basement, either in an existing home or one under construction. The shelter would add about $500 to the cost of a new home and would give excellent fallout protection. In construction of any one of these shelters, four essential features must be completed. The first is a proper entrance. It must have at least one right angle turn. Radiation travels in straight lines and only a fraction of it is scattered by the air or materials it strikes. So the sharp turn adds to the shielding. The second necessity is ventilation. This is provided in a concrete block basement shelter by vents in the wall and the open entrance. A blower may be installed for added comfort. For the other shelters, vent pipes and a blower is essential for proper ventilation. Good radio reception is the next essential. The shielding will cut it down. As soon as the shelter is completed, check the radio reception capabilities. It probably will be necessary to install an outside antenna to receive Conelrad broadcasts. Light is Dad's department. The Civil Defense Shelter booklet will show him how to fix a simple electrical system. This will furnish adequate low-level light if you have a spare battery. You will also want a flashlight or electric lantern for brighter light as needed. After your shelter is finished, you should stock it with the provisions and equipment you will need for a two-week stay. Since radiation outside may keep everyone inside, it is important that you have adequate supplies in your shelter. In choosing foods, place the emphasis on those which require no refrigeration and little cooking. Foods in cans or jars will stay in good condition six or more months if kept dry at a temperature between freezing and 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Goods in paper boxes may be kept for six months if they are stored in tightly closed metal cans under the same dry, moderate temperatures. Be sure they are in a spot where rodents and insects won't attack them. Plan meals so there will be no leftovers, thus eliminating the problem of rapid spoilage. Meat, poultry, fish, vegetables, fruit, and many other items can be purchased in suitable quantities for such planning. It is a good practice to rotate canned foods at least once or twice a year. Exchange those in unprotected paper boxes at least every three months. Don't forget foods for infants, elderly persons, diabetics, or others who might require a special diet. Be sure that you choose foods which fit the preferences of your family. Civil defense officials have sample menus showing the quantity of food which should be set aside for each person for two weeks. Use this as your guide. Water will also be an important item. You will need a minimum of one half gallon per day per person. It should be stored in clean containers, preferably jugs, bottles, or jars with tight-fitting covers. Water in your hot water tank may also be used 
if it is close to the shelter. The container should be cleaned and refilled at least once every three months to keep the water palatable. Water purification tablets should be on hand to treat water which might contain harmful bacteria. For cooking and serving, you will want one or two pans, disposable tableware, paper plates, cups, and napkins. Don't forget a measuring cup, can opener, and matches. You will also want a small cooking unit, which will use a minimum of oxygen. A battery-powered radio is essential to provide communications with the outside world. Store extra batteries in a dry, cool place. Check the reception periodically to be sure you can receive Conorad broadcasts. For cold weather, you will want lots of heavy clothing and warm bed clothes. In any weather, you will want some changes of clothing for all members of the family. A first aid kit will be very important. Your civil defense officials have a list of the basic first aid items you might need. You should also have a two-week supply of special medicines and equipment for the sick or chronically ill, such things as insulin and hypodermic needles for diabetics. If you have a baby, remember to include powdered formula, canned milk, bottles, nipples and disposable diapers, pins, talcum, and so on. Provide sanitation supplies such as cans with tight-fitting lids for human waste and garbage and a receptacle which can be used as a toilet. Don't forget such things as towels, toilet tissue, sanitary napkins, and soap. A 5% DDT solution will protect you from insects. Remember how hard it is to keep the children entertained on a rainy day? Maintaining a high morale in your shelter area will be even more difficult because of cramped quarters and monotonous surroundings. Appropriate religious articles, books, games, and other amusements will help. You will also want miscellaneous equipment, such as a calendar, clock, and candles. A screwdriver, rubber gloves, and a shovel also may come in handy. More information on supplies and equipment, together with information on the approved fallout shelters, is contained in this booklet. Use it as your guide in planning and stocking your shelter. Now let's suppose for a moment that you can't get to a shelter in an emergency. What can you do to protect yourself? First, look for a basement. One below ground level will cut radiation to one-tenth of the level outside. The safest spot is in a corner which is least exposed to windows and deepest below the ground. If there is adequate warning, you can improve a basement's protection substantially by blocking the windows with bricks, dirt, books, magazines, or other heavy materials. If you are in a house with no basement, the best protection will be found on the ground floor in the central part of the house. The radiation there will be about half what it is outside. Large buildings such as apartment houses and office buildings afford excellent protection. With their thick walls and heavy floors, they provide almost as much shielding as the specially constructed concrete block shelter recommended for residences. If you have reason to believe you have fallout particles on your person or clothes, bathe thoroughly and leave the water outside the shelter. Outer garments also should be left outside and washed thoroughly before they are worn again. In washing exposed food or clothing, waterproof gloves should be worn. Fallout may be the primary threat which faces us in a national emergency, but keep in mind that it is a manageable threat. The right moves now will protect you and your loved ones later. 
you will need a good shelter and a two-week supply of food and water and other living essentials. If you have them ready and learn a few safety precautions, you and your family stand a first-rate chance of surviving any nuclear attack. Talk to your local or state civil defense officials immediately. They will give you detailed instructions on what you need to do. Then do it. Then you can rest assured that no matter what the fallout threat in the future, you and your family will be ready for it. You're watching Sleepcore, media for insomnia. present threat of instant and total annihilation. How did we get here? How did it all begin? It was born in another time, in a world like this. 1945, a global war fought by great navies and armies, great numbers of men and weapons, as wars had always been fought. Until 8.15, on the morning of August 6, 1945, when a single plane carrying a single bomb opened the age we now live in. The decision to drop an atomic bomb on the city of Hiroshima was perhaps the most important decision of our time. The controversy at Stern has gone on with rising intensity ever since. How was the decision made? Why was it made? Could the instant destruction of Hiroshima of 70,000 Japanese men, women and children have been avoided? In the spring of 1945, it was known that an atomic bomb would be made. All that remained was to decide whether and how to use it. This is the story of the 135 days of that decision. The first day, April 12, 1945. We interrupt this program with a special bulletin. A press association has announced that President Roosevelt is dead. The president died of a cerebral hemorrhage. All we know is that the president died in Warm Springs, Georgia. He has been president for 12 years longer than any other man. He is the only president many have known. Now, on this April afternoon, with the United States at war around the world, he is suddenly gone. Now someone else must make the life and death decisions. The vice president is almost unknown. He has been in office less than three months, obscured by the dominating figure of the president. Now he is president the leader by chance of the greatest military coalition in history. And takes the oath of office he never wanted to hold. Assumes the responsibilities for which he has had no time to be prepared or brief. He says, the moon, the stars, and all the planets just fell on me. He says, pray for me. He tells his cabinet, no one can fill the void that has been left. He says he will try to carry on Roosevelt's policies. When the cabinet leaves, one man stays behind. 78-year-old Secretary of War Henry L. Stimson, weary but iron-willed, with a secret he must now tell the new president. The moment is described by his friend and biographer, McGeorge Bundy. Mr. Truman tells of that conversation in this language. Stimson told me he wanted me to know about an important project that was underway, a project looking to the development of a new explosive of almost unbelievable destructive power. That was all he felt free to say, and his statement left me puzzled. It was the first information that had come to me about the atomic bomb. 
but he gave me no details. The Pentagon. The project to build the atomic bomb has been given the code name Manhattan District. It is being built under the direction of a recently promoted Brigadier General of the Corps of Engineers. His name is Leslie Groves. He reports only to Army Chief of Staff George Marshall, Secretary of War Stimson, and the President. A few doors away, the future strategy of the war is being planned. Few of the planners have been told the secret of the bomb. On Capitol Hill, congressmen who have appropriated $2 billion for the Manhattan District do not know on what the money is being spent. In laboratories around the country, there are men who know the secret. The scientists are deeply worried by the implications of the force they are about to let loose on the world. And I believe that the horror of the war that was on and the horror of the war which military planners expected to continue for a long time was so very great that uh, it was more or less taken for granted that if a new weapon could put an end to this agony, it should be so used. Any weapon that would bring uh, an end to the war and save uh, the lives, uh, save a million casualties among American boys uh, was justified. At lunchtime, Mr. Burns asked Dr. Lawrence to raise again the question that had been raised earlier simply in passing, namely that the weapon should not be used against the Japanese in the war, but that there should be a striking but harmless demonstration of this weapon in the hope that the Japanese might be persuaded to sue for peace. Coupled with this demonstration, of course, was the possibility that the weapon might have to be used subsequently if the Japanese were not sufficiently impressed. Remember, none of us had then ever seen a bomb go off. We had no idea as to what you could do or what sort of effect it would have. Someone finally said, unless these, this weapon is used with maximum impact, it may be very difficult for anyone to see much difference between it and the firebomb raids that were going on at that very time over Tokyo. June 1, the headlines say, B-29 fire raids burn 82 square miles of Japan. The divided Japanese leaders continue to argue about what to do, how to halt the slaughter. As this goes on, in Washington, the interim committee makes a unanimous recommendation to the president. Use the atomic bomb against Japan without warning. June 18, the main public event in Washington is a hero's welcome for General Dwight Eisenhower. As Eisenhower rides down Pennsylvania Avenue at the White House, a decision is being made. Secretary Stimson and the Joint Chiefs meet with the President. They tell him there is no alternative to invading Japan. They estimate the war will end in the fall, 1946. The atomic bomb is mentioned, but it has not yet been tested. No one knows what it will do. A delay in the invasion plans is not considered. The president agrees. He has no alternative. He orders the Joint Chiefs to go ahead. I remember that we first responded to the question, what do scientists think, by saying that they think a variety of things, and this is only natural. Uh, on the one hand, they hoped that this instrument would never be used in war, and therefore they hoped that we would not start out by using it. On the other hand, they hoped, or other people hoped, that it would put an end to this war, save countless lives, put an end to a, a, a butchery that had been going on for many years and had been marked by atrocities, concentration camps, murderous raids on cities, on Rotterdam and Dresden and Tokyo itself. A number of people um, began arguing that we should not use the bomb militarily because Germany was obviously collapsing 
and the Japanese were suffering many reverses. And so there was a great deal of discussion within the laboratory about uh, unwisdom of using the bombs militarily. You ask yourself, would the Japanese government as then constituted and with the bitter division between the, the peace party and the war party, would it have been influenced by a, an enormous nuclear firecracker detonated at great height doing little damage uh, and your answer is as good as mine I don't know I know only that I was told that an invasion was planned that it would be necessary and that it would be terribly costly and it is this information which Oppenheimer told us and it certainly had some effect on me and I began to think that maybe under these conditions such an in enormously drastic step as a military use of the bomb would be justified to reduce the total number of casualties and end the war much sooner. Then all of a sudden, an incredible flash of light eliminated everything many, many times brighter than sunlight does in New Mexico and at noon on a bright day. Many miles of the desert were completely blinding, and so I actually lost uh, my vision for a few seconds. When it recovered, I turned back, and I saw a huge ball of fire, bright yellow, rising through the atmosphere, and the whole atmosphere in the direction of the bomb was filled with strange violet light. most aesthetically beautiful things I have ever seen on an enormous scale was cloud was peach and pink and purple. We knew the world would not be the same. Few people laughed. Few people cried. Most people were silent. I remembered the line from the Hindu scripture, the Bhagavad Gita. Vishnu is trying to persuade the prince that he should do his duty and to impress him takes on his multi-armed form and says, now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. I suppose we all thought that one way or another.